What up, Brad fans? Welcome back to the show. Well, it's come to this. You've gone through every other podcast. You've gone through everything on Hulu, HBO, Amazon, Netflix, whatever it is. And you have now found yourself here with us on Two Brad For You. So thank you. Thanks for thanks for getting getting around to it. Um, I hope everyone's doing well in whatever form of lockdown, isolation, quarantine they find themselves in. I hope you're handling it as best you can, and I hope that you are safe and healthy. Let's keep that going, people. Uh, so for this episode, this Corona chat, we'll call it, uh, I was joined by a really good friend from back home in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, Mr. Josh Pollard. He is a good friend, as I said. We've known each other for like 20 years, gone, went to high school together. Um, and he is a economics guy, so studied that in university, now works in a financial capacity in the uh, renewable energy domain, so kind of a, an outlier for Alberta, as he's not in oil and gas. But um, he's also one of the biggest uh, political junkies I know. Loves to loves to get into that, so he's really well read, really well informed, really smart guy, um, and that's kind of the the bulk of what, what what we talk about. So we talked a little bit about the biology of the virus. He had some questions for me. Uh, we go through a little bit of that at the beginning, and then kind of shift to you know the the economics, like what what does our economic system look like after the virus? Is it the same? Um, what what kind of cracks are being exposed? by the by the the pandemic situation uh and then we kind of do the same about politics so we just had a really good chat um about the stuff that to be honest we are whatsapping uh, with uh each other all the time about so uh, i hope you enjoy it uh we played a really fun game of guess which dictator is going to fall or become stronger uh because of the pandemic at the end at the end of the episode uh so stick around for that um and yeah like i said just a a bit of a different style bit of a different tone i guess uh from the normal sort of hard science uh physical science stuff that we do but uh, i want to thank josh again for coming on because like i said just a great guy to talk to when it comes to world economics politics at any level super fun i enjoyed it um please do follow us on twitter and instagram at two brad for you Wherever you're getting this podcast, um, rate, like, subscribe, follow, all that kind of stuff. It helps us out. Leave a comment. Um, get in touch with the show if you have um, uh, topics that you want to talk about uh, or that you want us to talk about. And um, yeah, like I said, just hit us up on any of those platforms at 2 brad for you Twitter, Instagram, wherever you get the show. And enjoy this Corona chat with my good friend, Josh Pollard. All I, can th- all I can think of is just like, well, <laughs> this is interesting, eh? Isn't and it? you guys are, you guys are doing well over there though, right? You're stocked up on, on all your goods. Oh, we're totally stocked up. I mean, and we're pretty lucky because our supply chains have been okay. But I think that, I mean, we've known each other for 20 years. You know that I'm a bit of a pessimist and a worrier, <laughs> I think is fair to say. So, yeah, we uh, yeah. we stocked up on food and sort of all the essentials, alcohol, fairly mm-hmm. early on. Um, yeah. And have we've been... doors closed? No, I think... I think they're still open. I think that they're, I don't know for sure, um, Mm -hmm. but I think so. I think that we'd be hearing a lot more on WhatsApp about people being in a bad mood. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I'd guess that they're still open. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So then the other question I have, you know, you're back home, our home. Um, What's the mood of the of people are it you know because i've heard from a few people that they're like yeah everyone's been really chill everyone's been nice everyone's kind of been adhering more or less to the to the restrictions is that your experience yeah i mean in my sort of small circle that's definitely my 
experience. Um, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago now, I was doing a run to sort of restock up on a few things and I had to go to Walmart and then Safeway to get some different stuff. And people all seemed really, really sort of anxious at Walmart. No one wanted to even look at each other. <laughs> and it couldn't have been more of a sort of dichotomy, like complete other world. When I got into Safeway and Bonavista, people were smiling at each other. Everyone mm -hmm. was saying, oh, I know you need this distance. Like you're crossing over, go here. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was completely bizarre, but I mean, work-wise, family-wise, everyone is sort of understands the score and knows what has to be done. And uh, luckily, work-wise, I'm fairly insulated. My wife is a physiotherapist. She got laid off so she can watch Molly. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I talk to so few people, it's hard for me to really get a gauge on how things <laughs> are outside. I see people when I take walks. Um, everyone seems okay, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Stuff, it, Dude, uh, that was for me, like my lifestyle basically hasn't changed at all. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been working from home doing these podcasts and yeah. shit like this for three years now. So like for me, it was just like, yeah, this is basically pretty normal i've seen all this shit of people like it's so difficult to work at home i was like mm. yeah you know put your it's, sweatpants uh, on and get to work but well exactly and you know i'm a sweatpants guy to begin with so it's <laughs> i'm a shut-in sort of person uh so no it's i didn't realize how social i actually am until i wasn't allowed to be though because mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. there's been a lot of skyping and a lot of drinking on skype with friends and right yeah which has been good it's been pretty therapeutic uh, yeah to tell you it's amazing how, um, how, how, yeah, how you realize that. And that was the thing, like I said, like my day to day lifestyle hasn't changed so much because I work from home, but not going out in the evening to the pub or whatever to meet friends and stuff that has been, I've been like, yeah, this is crazy. Like, this is nuts. And then to see everyone gathering on Skype and having these weird, at first weird Skype interactions, because the thing that bothers me the most about it is that you can't like, split off like a table when you're at a table you know you can kind of split off into these different conversations you can't do that on skype no there's it's none of that yeah one person the next person the next person so yeah oh yeah and i've listened to some of my wife's uh facetimes and it's there's probably five people and five people are speaking at once <laughs> so it's the kind of thing where you're like no one's saying anything no one's yeah. listening there's i just want to hear the noise yeah which is <laughs> just, fine but. yeah 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 but it is interesting to me. And like, it's one of the, again, you know, living here and then, you know, trying to talk with friends back home. I was always like, when I first moved here, of course, I was like, you know, Skype, it's a great tool, you know, and WhatsApp, the video call and stuff like that. I was like, we can do this, you know, time zone things a bitch. But there was always like this weird, you know, like apprehension behind it. Like, yeah. oh, this is going to be weird. And like, we have to like schedule this time to like have this call and do this mm -hmm. thing. And it was like a barrier. And then with a few people, once you do it, you kind of realize that it's not that at all. Like it's, it's pretty normal. You can just, it's like calling somebody, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that this is like, this whole situation is getting so many more people used to this, you know, new way of communicating or whatever that it's like, it might change the way like some people even just, you know, do stuff. And I've heard oh, from relatives doubt, yeah. that I haven't heard from in ages. <laughs> Just reaching yeah. out on different yeah. things. Just be like, you're in Germany. Are, is it okay? <laughs> yeah. So what's it like there uh, in <laughs> Europe? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This big. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. good. Uh, we talked a little bit before we started here about some of the situation in Europe. Um, you were mentioning the Netherlands and Sweden, did you say? Yeah, yeah. I've done a bit of reading and just about how their reaction in comparison to most sort of OECD countries is a lot more lax in terms mm -hmm. of what you can do, where you can go. And I don't really have a science background, so I'm curious why they're taking that approach. Like, is it that their healthcare system is just so much more robust that they're not so worried about the surges and then mm -hmm. potentially they won't be overwhelmed. Or like initially when I read about the Netherlands, it seemed like 
they were pretty pessimistic for the timing of getting a vaccine. So they almost wanted to get herd immunity as quickly mm-hmm. as possible. And obviously mm-hmm. I know nothing about that, but curious mm-hmm. if you have any opinions or have looked into it much. Yeah. Well, I mean, cause this was, this was the, the UK was apparently going for this um, strategy as well. Boris Johnson was out saying, using the actual term herd immunity in uh, press conferences and stuff early on. And then he was you know, roundly criticized by a lot of health professionals. Um, and then it, it, it turns out that it might have been the, the uh, there was a study by Imperial College London, I think, one of their yeah. infectious disease groups that had modeled these things and they might have made a mistake in the modeling or something. And yeah. then we're like, oh, wait, <laughs> way more people are going to die if we don't do anything. The herd immunity thing, it's like, it makes sense, right? Like on, um, uh, from a biology perspective and from just like logic of what we know about diseases and stuff, the thing that you, that what makes it a risky, uh, move is that you don't like, there's the surge, right? Like the surge in cases. And if you get that all at once, you could overwhelm your healthcare. Um, so it's like, if you're trying to manage herd immunity, you, you got to have like really good levers on who's getting sick when, like, and that's right. just like to, to be able to do that is good good fucking luck, you know? Um, The other thing is that we don't know how much immunity you get from having the disease. It's not like, it's not like, it's not, you can't say it's like chicken pox where it's like you get it and then you're good for life, right? So yes, when you have, when you're exposed to a disease or different things, your immune system has some kind of memory, right? Like it's, this is the principle of vaccines. That's how it works, right? And that's how you get over it initially, right? Yeah, 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 your immune system, basically, it's like, if if it doesn't kill you before your immune system kills it, right, then you're good, right? And so um, there's certain diseases that immune systems just can't deal with, rabies, you know, if you get rabies, you're 100% dead, there's your immune yeah. system's not going to stop that. Um, I mean, maybe I guess, well, anyway, we don't have to go down that road. But um, the thing is that 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 memory, that immune memory that like the principle of vaccines is based on and stuff like that for each disease, for each different thing that you're exposed to, it's different. It's a different response for some. This is why you need booster shots, right? Because it can fade over time. So for some vaccines or for some diseases like chickenpox, you get it once you're exposed once and you get this really strong, robust uh, immune system memory so that you can't get it again. You're basically immune to it, you're resistant to it. But we don't know what that, we don't know how that works for coronavirus because nobody has ever seen this this disease before. It's the first time mm-hmm. that it's ever been in, in humans, this strain, this particular you know, strain of virus. So to, to go for herd immunity, it's like, yeah, okay, but maybe the, the immune system, maybe it's a really weak response. Maybe it only lasts a month. Maybe it, you know, there's all of these unknown factors that you just, you just don't know. So until you can get the data on that, uh, we won't know. And this is where like, so everyone's talking about testing and stuff too, right? So this is where um, a really good uh, blood test or antibody test is, would be preferable. Cause right now the tests to say whether you have it or not, is basically just um, they look for the virus RNA. So the virus is made of RNA, not DNA. So they basically, they swab for that in your, like deep in your throat or your nose or whatever, the places where it lives. Um, And if they find it, then it's like, okay, we have found virus in you right now. Therefore, you're positive. But if if you've had the virus and have cleared it, you would test negative. But if you have a really nice blood uh, blood test that looks for antibodies for the virus, then you could say, ah, that person had it. They, maybe they don't have it now, but they had it. And then with that data, you could start to look at, okay, well, how many people have had it overall and get better accurate numbers? That would give you a better accurate uh, sense of the death, um, the mortality rate and things like that. But it would also inform all of this data on herd immunity. How do you have a lot of antibodies? How robust is that antibody response? If we test you from six months, will you still have those antibodies? That kind of thing. So that's why the herd immunity thing is like, it's kind of just like, uh, yeah. bold move, but <laughs> good well, luck. You sure, know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and the are they still developing the antibody testing? And if so, <laughs> even when they don't know how long it lasts, I would imagine that's pretty helpful in determining the spread in the short term. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like I said, it's preferable because you can know you don't just know who has it now; you know who's had it, right? In total, right? Yeah. Um, so it gives you a better and a more accurate idea of how many people have actually been infected and then that will give you you know that that changes all of these things that we've heard in the news about like uh uh r not i don't know if you've heard about that one but yeah. it's a factor yeah. that like how many people if someone has it how many spread people, it yeah. To? Yeah. yeah so that will change you know if we find out that like oh shit there was this whole group of people that we didn't even know had it but they all have the antibodies for it obviously it was more transmissible than we thought um, or they were asymptomatic and didn't get exactly, testing to be in exactly so there are they do they're those they're called serological tests uh which is serum blood serum tests um those are coming on they they do exist it's just it yeah. wasn't the the first thing they have um so we'll see those rolling out and stuff i mean at the is it going to change the situation on the ground right now probably not um mm -hmm. You know, but it's one of those things that it's it's quicker to do as well. Actually, those tests, I believe, I could be wrong on that, but I think they're quicker to do than the the RNA tests. But um, yeah, and there's that uh, that new test that I think just got FDA approval that takes I think 15 minutes to get a mm -hmm. result rather than mm -hmm. a few days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know much about it. I think it's a blood test. I think it's a serological test. So they're looking for it. Okay. I think that's one of those. Yeah. But I, okay. I didn't read specifically about it. So I don't know. But that's where that's where that will be. That's where those tests play a role It's not only can they, you know, and, and, and it's a little different then because it's like, okay, we can say, we can't say with the RNA test, the strength is that we know you have it now, like you have virus particles in your throat, say, so you can right. be like, you need to stay away from people because, you know, you're going to be coughing that shit up everywhere, you know, um, whereas the blood one, it's like, okay, do you, are you still infectious? We don't know, but we know that you've been exposed. Um, maybe they can have some kind of um, threshold where they could say like, oh, if you have this higher level of antibodies, then you're probably infectious, but you would probably couple it with you have the antibodies and you're showing symptoms. Therefore, right. you're, you're positive. Now you're not have been positive. And I'm assuming if you got a positive blood test, the, the recommendation would still just be isolation for 14 days or whatever it is, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I, with the blood test too and making these threshold quantifications, that's down the road because you need so much data to say like, what is the average response? And that's yep. the interesting thing about this virus already is that the, the range of symptoms that people you know some people are dying some people don't feel anything some people kind of get a cold you know that's been sort of the hardest thing for me to grapple with is it seems like it's sort of a crapshoot you know other, people who have uh, prior medical conditions especially if they're to do with the lungs they seem to be doing worse and older people course, generally yeah. but smoking it smoking um blood type i've heard has an impact on it but then it also seems like it is a bit dice. random at times yeah mm -hmm. no for sure and at the end of the day will we get a clearer picture why it's harder on certain people or do you think that that will always to some extent be a mystery uh i mean I don't know. That's really like speculation, what kind of research they can and will do. Um, no, I mean, I think you'll get a better idea of why, for sure. Like, I mean, the more data you get, the more information you get, you get yeah. you'll get. you have a better thing. But the thing is, is that it's just like when you think about, like we think about, okay, there's these are the characteristics of the virus, but the host environment plays so much of a role into that. And our immune right. systems are so incredibly complex and so varied and so different that it's like to try and tease out all of these factors, you know, as to like, you, it's, it's, you'd need like the supercomputer algorithm to look at all of the, you know, possibilities and all of the different things. And then there's the environmental factors too, right? The, which is lifestyle, but also, 
Um, there's things like um, how much of the virus were you exposed to at once? So if you got like a big snot in the face or versus yeah. like a little misting of it, you know, like sometimes these things have um, play a role in, in, in the later on outcome of, of how it all goes. And I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's just a lot of things to 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 go through and they'll get some ideas, they'll, they'll you know, and it, like the blood type thing, for example, is. That's a known thing in virus research that there's certain blood types that, and it's just the nature of your immune system because blood type has to do, plays a role with your immune system too. That's why you can't um, give someone the wrong blood type because their immune system will recognize it as not their, not their own cells. Um, so there's some connection there. And, and this is stretching my knowledge <laughs> to, to the, to, to the nth degree. But um, so, yeah, I, who knows? Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know if we'll, how clear of a picture we'll get on that. And the other thing too, is that like, once they get the vaccine, once we get sort of past this thing, how much are people going to care about the thing that we have the vaccine for? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, um, what a bizarre time. It, uh, it feels like two months ago was a decade ago. <laughs> you know, I remember having a conversation in the office with a few people saying we were talking about how likely it was that we would have some sort of quarantine or work from home. And people were like, yeah, that would be really bizarre, you know? Yeah. And uh, little did we know that uh, <laughs> it would happen pretty quickly. <laughs> pretty yeah. fucking fast. Yeah. It seemed yeah. like for me, the sort of, and this is, sort of a silly thing but when everything sort of came into perspective even though i am a bit of a news junkie i follow things it seemed like when they canceled the nba season mm -hmm. that's when everything sort of <laughs> fell into place for me initially and i was like oh man this is a this, this is real. gonna change everything yeah yeah, yeah. just yeah, because yeah. all the money involved and yeah i mean yeah. And I think that's the thing. That's that seemed like the moment that North America woke up to it. And I think when, that's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. And when North America woke, it was interesting because Germany, they, I was reading a lot of criticisms um, within like in German media, like some circles within German media talking about that we haven't done the social distancing measures quick enough or strict enough. Cause I mean, here we're still not like the situation in Italy. Like we don't, we're not locked down. Like we it's, you're not allowed to gather in groups of two, um, more than groups of two. Um, unless they're, you're sort of your, your, the people you live with, you know, um, right. all essential shops are closed. Um, and they're like, they're like, don't go out unless you have to like go to the store and go home, go for a run if you want to go for a run. But I mean, you go outside on a Sunday and the weather's been beautiful here. So you go outside on a Sunday and it's like, there's groups of families walking around and stuff. Like nobody's in the parks, you know, grilling or whatever, but it's not, it's not like it is in Italy where it's like, you're, you know, police being like, get the fuck back in your house, you know? Yeah. Um, I know there's some states that it's like that in Germany. Cause this is the other thing is that uh, in Germany, the it's more, the states have more power in a lot of these, most of these measures. So health and policing and all of this stuff. And obviously there's a historical reason that there's a distrust of the. We don't need to get into that, but you know, it's... <laughs> they don't really like to invoke the emergency powers act from the, from the federal government on down. Um, so that's, yeah. So different States have it at different levels. And I think some of the border States with France, cause France is really bad. They sort of have, clamp down harder uh and there was one state in the north i think that basically they did people weren't listening at all people were still like just being like fuck you we're just gonna hang yeah. out outside and do whatever the we Florida want of germany yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> um and so they uh the minister the 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 head of the state there he like was like ordered like a big police operation and they basically sent the police out and clamp shit down and they're like, we don't want to have to do this again. So just like, listen, you know, so, but I think there is like, you can get fined for breaking the rules and stuff. I don't know if it's 
all over Germany, but definitely in some places. And the state next to us, to the north of us, one of the states next to us, uh, is sort of the epicenter of the outbreak here. So I think they have tighter restrictions. But anyway, so it's like we weren't we were getting this like you know slow to kind of to move on it, slow to kind of move on it. And then when the when North America started really taking it seriously, and Trump stopped flights from Europe then it kind of also i think shifted the the response over here as well so that would seem to be a moment maybe it's just because i'm a north american and i still kind of follow that side of the pond the news and stuff but right. it was like i said i was i was traveling on a bus across the country when that shit happened and there was no sort of it wasn't weird for me to be doing that whereas now that would be a weird thing for me to be doing um but but you think that that's sort of dichotomy between germany and italy is because of the mortality rate differential mm. i mean mm. i think i was reading and italy is ticking up close to somewhere around 10 percent mortality rate of infections yeah. and i think germany yeah. is yeah well this is something that we that has been talked about a lot uh, is the mortality the really low mortality rate in germany because i think it's like as of like even a couple of days ago this is what thursday april 2nd or 3rd that we're doing yeah this? second um all the, all the days just blend together now <laughs> <laughs> it's nighttime i know that <laughs> yeah that's how um, my daughter approaches things yeah the sun comes up the sun goes down yeah, yeah. it's That's a beautiful it. way to <laughs> um uh yeah so the yeah the mortality rate um and it's been talked about a lot as to what's going on now it is going up so germany is starting to see uh an increase in those deaths but as of a couple of days ago what i was going to say is we were like germany was like fifth in the world in cases but like tenth in deaths or something like this and mm -hmm. so you you know we mentioned the netherlands a bit they have like you know germany has what like okay this is a ballpark you know me they're not to take these numbers as gospel but i think about seventy thousand cases and the netherlands is somewhere like twenty thousand, maybe less something like that and they have more deaths than us by a couple hundred so it was weird it's weird in that that was happening and there's a couple of um reasons that it could happen i mean first of all it could be um not a fudging of the data but just like are they counting people that are dying at home or are they only right. counting people that are dying in the hospitals um again because you have this sort of less centralized um infrastructure you also have that every day they they have to get the numbers from all the different places and then put them together um, so there's kind there's usually some kind of a lag in the numbers there, but yeah. uh, that doesn't to me really explain why the the death were so low for so long because we were rocking like fifty thousand, sixty thousand cases and a couple hundred deaths, which is way different than anyone else. So um, the other th the reasons that that could be is testing. So Germany apparently did a really good job of testing early and uh, often. And so it could just be that what you see in Germany is a more more accurate picture of what's going on. Whereas in Italy, there's just a ton more people that have it and they just don't know it, you know, exactly. or, yeah. or something like that. So it could be that. The other thing is that when you look at um, uh, what what's the what's the acronym again? The OCED countries? OECD. OECD. Yeah. Uh, Germany ranks like top five in terms of hospital beds per capita and ICU beds per capita. So they were, in theory, better able to manage the, the caseload. Whereas in Italy, yeah. I think what happened is, and I mean, who knows, like this is all, we'll find out more details as, as this shit goes on. But it looks like it's it happened really quick, like they were caught off guard. Um, and the the healthcare system got swamped uh, before they could do you know before they could put any measures in. And really, I mean, like they were the first in Europe to really like pop off, right? So the rest of Europe kind of was just like, oh shit, what's going on over there? We should get our act together. Um, so it's and then once you have the once you have the healthcare system totally overwhelmed, then a lot of other people are dying that necessarily might not have died. Uh, mm -hmm. If you had enough 
ventilators, blah, 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 all this stuff. So there's, there's that issue as well. Um, but it looks like Germany now, like I said, the, now we're getting, we'll cross, I believe today we'll probably cross into the thousand dead mark. Um, yeah, I'm looking at stats right now and it's, uh, 1,097 and yeah. 85,000 cases. Uh -huh. Yeah. So still a death rate that's really low in comparison to other places. But um, they're worried now that um, that the surge is coming. So like I'm I'm kind of thinking that the next two to three weeks in Germany will be bad, um, yeah. and hopefully they can they've put in enough preparations to to manage it. Because I know they were they've activated the army, which again is not something that Germans are reluctant or they do very easily on their own soil. Um, but they the army is now. Um, so army hospitals are open for, for, for cases and the, the army was in Berlin building a temporary hospital and that kind of stuff. So, um, so hopefully they, they'll be able to sort of ride the wave, you know, but I expect that the, the death rate is going to go up pretty dramatically here in Germany. Um, hopefully not too dramatically, but we'll see. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. So, but it, it, it has been kind of a epidemiological mystery as, as to why it was, why it was that way. But dead, you know, we, this is, this is why having a well-funded healthcare system is, you know, and this kind of gets to some of the stuff that we've, we've been chatting about on WhatsApp a little bit where it's like, um, having, uh, having insurance, you know, having like a cushion for this kind of stuff, the rainy day fund, you know, if we want to mm -hmm. go into the economic side of it, but I mean, it's also with your healthcare and, and stuff like that. And like, nobody seems to have that at all. Oh yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. It, uh, I mean, firstly, it's sort of argument 1000 for the fact that private healthcare <laughs> probably isn't a good idea and running yeah. hospitals as a, as a business <laughs> probably doesn't make a lot of sense. No, no. Like it, uh, I don't want to get started on that, but the fact that the state's the number one reason for personal bankruptcy is health related costs. It's insane to me in 2020. It's madness. Yeah. So hopefully that's one thing that, uh, improves out of this whole sort of disaster, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's absolutely wild. It, uh, I'm really quite scared for what happens when things get bad in India, when things get bad in Russia and in Africa, South mm -hmm. America. I mean, because India has, I think, responded quite well to this. They put in quite strict regulations, but that's not a country where there's a democracy and where there's, you know, very independent regions that you can do this for too long. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like their healthcare system is going to be very quickly overwhelmed. They don't mm -hmm. have the capacity to deal with things as is. And India is just an example, but that's kind of when the states came out and said that their optimistic case was 100,000 to 240,000 deaths. <laughs> and scaling that up from there, that is just, it is pretty frightening, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I know in some ways because of the weight issues in the States and the, they may be a little bit more, Fat. um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Let's not tiptoe around it. <laughs> they may be a bit more susceptible to, to a virus like this. Um, but I think that poverty has to play a huge role in it, oh, it at will. the same yeah. time. I mean, so it, uh, it's going to be a scary wild ride for the next who knows how long. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But uh, well, and to me, it, it, it also highlights this like, and I don't know, this is, you know, people always talk about like globalism and if it's good or bad. And I think it's like one of those things where it's like, I'm, we could probably piece apart different things that say why it's good or bad on different separate issues. Right. But this yeah. is one to me that shows that, global poverty will affect everybody in a situation like this because as long as this thing is popping off in one part of the world no part of the world is safe 
You know, you cannot build a wall around Africa. You cannot build a wall around India. You know, you we yeah. can we can shut down flights and stuff like that, which will help. But, you know, do we want to do that? Like, do you want to live in that world where, no, you're only allowed to go to these certain places? You know, like it just it's so the poverty issue and this issue of like, well, you know, we don't have to worry about these poor countries. Well, we do, because if the diseases are spreading rampantly there and are out of control there then right. everybody is at risk you know and that's the same in the u.s right like so if you just look at it as on a national scale or on a global scale so it's one of those things this is one of those situations where it's like it kind of i don't know this is maybe the optimist in me you're the <laughs> you're the self-proclaimed <laughs> pessimist but i'm like if anything out of this you could see that you know we're all one you know like the real cheesy however you want to put it but it's like we're in i'm all together. for the cheesiness yeah. we are we couldn't be more all in this together and you make a really good point that i think firstly i've probably been one of the biggest proponents for globalization in our group mm -hmm. and it's incredible the amount of people it's brought out of poverty and mm -hmm. blah 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 there's so many reasons to push for it but in the last couple of years and especially this has sort of exemplified the fact that it is maybe not on the whole a net benefit. Mm. I mean, you look at, for instance, the fact that we can't procure enough masks for our healthcare professionals because we offshored those manufacturing, the manufacturing of that PPE to places like, you know, China and Bangladesh and Vietnam which makes sense from an economic perspective. But when you look at vital resources, the fact that we don't have a backup or a huge inventory of those items, mm -hmm. and we're also getting them from overseas, it just makes absolutely no sense, you mm -hmm. know? And so something like this, Oddly enough, it's going to show the holes in globalization, but it's also going to increase sort of the, there isn't a good way to put this, but the Amazonification of the world, you know, mm. there's mm. a reason why Amazon is hiring a hundred thousand new employees <laughs> through this crisis. When everyone because, else is laying off. Exactly. Which is, it's a great thing for the short term. It's great to have those services. It's great to sort of offset all the job losses by being able to hire new people into those jobs. But on the whole, it's probably not a good thing for the world, mm -hmm. you know, both from an environmental perspective, from a local business perspective, just throughout the chain. And I, on top of that, one of the arguments that I was always saying that globalization was good is because all of these sort of one party states will probably adopt more Western style democracies as they get richer and mm -hmm. as we bring them into the global community. But if anything, I think that's been the opposite. Mm -hmm. They've used the fact that we're open systems to get stronger and stronger. And if anything, they've gotten less open. They've shared less. You know, so it's, it's pretty telling when something like this happens that sort of your ingrained beliefs, regardless of your experience, may not always be true. And that's something that I've been grappling with a ton mm -hmm. in the last sort of month or so. Yeah. So, well, I mean, and there's a number of articles you can look to. Uh, that I think have used a quote or similar, you know, wording where it's like these kind of things will show the cracks in your in your system, you know, like this is where you, oh, yeah. you know, the test, the, the pressure test, you know. But so it's the, that old Warren Buffett saying. I think it was Warren Buffett. He says, "You don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out, <laughs> and the tide has gone out." Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, so this is the thing then, like so with with the globalism thing you know we've 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 gotten rid of the production of all of these uh different things and sh shipped them over to other places because it was cheaper right yeah and then that's good for those people because they have jobs and it you know lifts these people out of out of poverty that's sort of you know the 
the good part of it. We'll say like in the best case scenario, it's cheaper right. for us, jobs for them. Every like you know the tide lifts all the boats or whatever. Um, exactly. But obviously, yeah. So like when the things when the when the shit hits the fan like this, then the supply chains are fucked. Then you know you you start to realize that you need these things and and you can't get them. So, the, but then is this a matter of like can can you pick and choose? You know, are, is it just that we have to pick and choose which things we sort of produce locally uh, versus, you know, shipping it? Because to me, this seems like, I mean, this again, this is, I'm, when it comes to economics, politics, this kind of stuff, I always think like big picture, you know, because that's yeah. just the only, I don't understand the rest of it. So that's like, this is where I go. It's just this big, but it seems like it's just in general a lot of the things that we've seen in the 21st century, the sort of big, you know, you know, the economic downturn in 2008, you know, now this, right. this kind of thing, it's exposing that like money efficiency, like this quest for how can we do things? How can we maximize profit? And that is the fucking, yeah. that is the mantra. That is everything. Just maximize profit it's offshore here. Doesn't it? Yeah. We'll lose some jobs here, but they'll get jobs and we'll get that shipper cheaper. And it's just, everything is just, maximum 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 how do we generate the most wealth and that wealth isn't even like trickling down we don't even have to go there yet like it's 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 staying at the top that it's getting bigger so yeah if to me that's the thing that that we're that we're seeing out of this then it's like couldn't that be the lesson where it's like okay certain things shouldn't be you know like we just said healthcare shouldn't be for profit you know certain things like why do we need to you know like let's spend on the things that actually matter and i guess this is one of the things that we, you know we, we were talking about this economic the economist article um that we shared uh mm -hmm. earlier today but it's like is spending going to be seen as a bad thing you know i mean that wasn't the whole piece of the article but that's kind of what i got out of it is like when people have seen government spend to like bail out the people and you know, avoid an economic crisis or when, when governments then want to be like, Oh, we don't have money for this. It's like, actually, I think you do because we've seen it, <laughs> you know, we, we witnessed it. And I don't like, I'm sure there's like an economic argument where you can't like inflation, deflation, whatever, all this shit that I don't understand. But to me, it just seems like the idea of like, we have to cut spending, cut spending, maximize profits, all of this stuff. This seems like a terrible, like if we haven't learned that lesson already, maybe now is the time to learn the lesson that look at there's going to be some things that you just got to pay for and that you just have to put a value on even if you're not going to maximize your dollar healthcare the environment you know climate yeah. change will be the next one like if we can if you get through this pandemic you know the rolling you know the next whatever 10 years of eight hurricanes a year is going to be the next thing you know and it comes slower but it's the same idea. So I don't know. I just kind of rambled on there for a bit, but it's like, I think you get what I'm saying. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I mean, I think you make lots of good points and governments in the West have been careful in some respects of what they allow to have foreign ownership and what is able to be offshored and produced in different countries. You know, for instance, a really easy example is they'd never let a Russian company own a company that owns nuclear facilities right. in North America. Right. Um, but I think that one thing that we're realizing is that it's a lot more comprehensive than that. We need to be a lot more careful about how far we extend our supply chains and a whole bunch of different avenues. And Globalization is hugely complicated. It's hard to say whether it's a net positive or not. I think some of the results in the West have been good because it's made things cheaper, but it's also whittled away the middle class. It's been largely a benefit to the developing world. That aside, I think that we're definitely seeing the holes in it mm -hmm. right now. And I think that when you talk about governments having a harder time saying that we can't afford this going forward. In my opinion, I think it's going to be the opposite because everyone is going to be so saddled with debt and everyone is going to be fighting 
to keep their credit ratings up, to keep their cost of debt low, um, that I think a lot more essential services, unfortunately, politicians are going to try to cut them. Hmm. It's sad. I don't think it's the way to go about things. But in the states of the U.S., for example, they enacted, they passed a $2 trillion stimulus package. And that's supposed to f- keep the sort of economy on life support for the next couple of months. If this thing goes in sort of ebbs and flows for the next 18 months, are they going to saddle themselves with $10 trillion more in debt? And everyone's been talking about how huge their debt is to begin with. I think that they only have, I could be wrong about this. I think they only have $20 trillion in debt to begin with. If they put $10 trillion on top of that, the states will probably be fine. But if countries like Greece do that or France does that or Brazil does that, that's a whole different thing. They might start looking like Argentina or you know, countries that are sort of in a continual state of financial crisis. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I wish it was used as a way to sort of promote further government spending, showing people that they have a right to health care, that they have a right to a, a certain standard of living. But the pessimist in me is coming out again and my thinking is that politicians will use it as a way to defund programs, as a way to say, at the same time as we have an aging population and we have commitments to them, we are also saddled with more debt than ever and more debt servicing payments than ever. And so we need to cut back everywhere we can. That's my impression anyhow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How, this, is, this is probably going to be a really naive kind of question but you know if everybody is going into debt like the whole world is going into debt doesn't it kind of like equal everything out or and this is like again shows my absolute naive naivete i guess you would say in economics is like can't you just like cancel it (laughs) you know what hey look everybody 2020, that was a year. We're just putting a little black just, line over there. We'll let's just pretend that didn't we'll just start over, you know? <laughs> so all the money that you had before that, you still have. Because, I mean, in the end, yeah. it's a, like it's a made-up thing. It, I mean, it's all digital. It's all on a computer somewhere. Um, we just go in there, so it's, move a couple zeros around, and... Yeah, exactly. Just, you know, <laughs> hit delete a couple of times. It So... I wish that was the case, but it's going to be a lot less impactful on safe haven currencies or or countries with really strong economies, right? So you're seeing, you can invest in a federal treasury note in the States for 10 years and you'll get less than 1% interest on that security. So what that's really saying is that there are so many private investors who are saying, well, this is a safe haven currency. I am, I don't care what they do. It's this, it's the Swiss franc and it's uh, Japan's debt that I am totally fine with. I don't care how much debt they pile on. Japan, I think has, their debt is I think 250% of GDP, and that was before the crisis, but everyone knows that their economy is going to keep trucking along. Whereas you look at Italy's economy, you look at these economies that aren't efficient, that have high unemployment, that have a hard time doing things really well, and also have low growth rates. Investors in the private market are going to have a much harder time investing in them at the rates that they're at when they pile on the debt that is required to keep the economy on life support, as I said. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I wish that was the case, but unfortunately it's going to be a lot harder on countries whose economies aren't working as well as Germany's or Canada's or the States. But again, why Um, can't you just like 
forgive the debt? Well, I mean, there's a history of forgiving debt to countries who it's just totally known that they can't make the payments. I don't know how that works on a global scale. It's we're in such unprecedented times that who knows what's going to happen. It's sort of like a sentence that I've heard on a few calls from bankers is that the theory right now is to fix today's problems and then <laughs> hope that you can fix tomorrow's problems when they come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the kind of state of affairs we're in right now, which is I've never heard central bankers speak like this. I've never heard economists speak like this. Even 2008, everyone was saying like, we'll figure things out. Lehman and Bear Stearns may have been integral to you know, the systemic risk of the country, but it was never sort of a choice between the economy or saving people's lives on a big scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, again, this to me, it just seems like then this, what is this teaching us then? You know, like this is teaching us that like we're at the limits of what this system can do in yep. terms of responding to what is a very real thing like pandemic disease like that's it's older than us you know that like this this is it's not like this is some you know new thing that oh my god you know so it's and to think that it would you know that it wouldn't happen again yeah or that it couldn't happen again arguably you could say that as we have more and more people on the planet that it's more likely to happen again oh without you know? a doubt so uh yeah. So then again, what is this teaching us about the holes in the system and how do we, how do we fix them? Is there, is, is, I mean, maybe, maybe this is again, really radical and it speaks to how dumb I am when it comes to economics, but is this a moment where it's like, uh, if not a total change of how we do things or at least a very drastic shift in, well, what are we, how are we running this show? What are the things that we're putting value on? Uh, GDP, you know, growth, all of these things mm -hmm. is now a moment to, to really like, be like, okay, we need to, we need to change this because look where we are. Or is it, like you said, we're in this moment. I mean, obviously in the acute phase, you have to deal with today's problems and yep. to move forward. Yep. But if this isn't like a, a giant wake up call, like if we just like 18 months, we get a vaccine and everything just goes back to the, everyone's just like, okay, let's just, Pretend that never happened. Okay, your countries, you got a fuck ton of debt. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. Let's just that to me seems like a travesty. But I don't understand enough to know what would this, what would the change? What are the options? You know, is there an option to change it? What would the options be? What would that look like? So I don't think that there's tons of great options to tell you the truth. I think hopefully. And this kind of flies in the face of what I think will probably happen. Hopefully we understand and the richest among us understand that at some point, the top 1% shouldn't own 30 to 50% of the wealth. And they should realize that, yeah, you started a company, but do you deserve to be a billionaire? Does anyone need a billion dollars? And this is kind of, I'm not even sure if I agree with this, yeah. but I know what you mean. You I start hope, to, all I the hope communist that the wealth to come out disparity like, oh. completely. I hope that the wealth disparity that people realize that it has fluctuated too much. Mm -hmm. It's on too much of a tangent and it should go back to, instead of being what it was in the 1920s, it should be what it was in the 1950s, where after you make a million dollars a year, the government taxes you a pretty heavy percentage of what you earn. Mm -hmm. And it's something a lot higher than 30 or 35%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that that would uh, help the world. And I hope that social services and social programs are better funded going forward. But again, the pessimist in me finds it hard to see that governments should stay uh, or keep running deficits when the economy does kick up. And 
they're either going to keep running deficits if they keep the tax regime where it is, or they're going to have to really kick up taxes on the wealthiest among us or potentially even corporations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, we're in a bizarre place, but I mean, someone got criticized for saying you shouldn't let a good uh, crisis go to waste yeah. in the Obama regime. And that can sound like an awful thing, but I think that what they were saying was cr crises exemplify issues with your current system and your current way of life. Mm -hmm. And if there's ever going to be a time to put in, you know, policies that fix things, it's right now or it's right afterwards. And hopefully that's the case, but it's, uh, hopefully we all live to see it. I mean, hopefully <laughs> us and all our friends and all our family are there. So, yeah. Well, and that's, I don't know, that's the interesting thing about the nature of this situation too. And this is, you know, going back a bit to the, to, to the disease, it's like, it's almost the perfect disease for like a giant shakeup like this, because it's not deadly enough that it's going to kill all of us. Right. Like, it's not like that. Like, so we'll be yeah. able to, there's not going to be anarchy in the streets. Right. Exactly. You know, people aren't going to. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, we're just going to have to like realize, you know, that we're vulnerable. Like it's like taking one on the chin and being like, okay, we can, we can get knocked down. We're not as, you know, impenetrable as we thought. You know, but we're not right. going to go like this isn't going to wipe out the species. You know, it's not a species ender, but it's like, here we go. This is the thing. And I think that that's I mean, some of these things you, you were just talking about, you know, a more efficient tax collection. You know, I mean, tax loopholes is another thing. It's not even just taxing oh. the wealthy. It's like fucking tax loopholes are, you know, a huge thing. So but I think that's the idea that we could get that could come out of it. Uh, and this is optimist brad <laughs> is that this would be the god bless you yeah, <laughs> so this, would be, <laughs> this is the moment to be like because this is something that i've we've been talking about um you know before this happened before this crisis you know uh again with climate and 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 other things you know or like the collapsing oil industry in in alberta in our home uh it's like how what wealth inequality what what are our priorities what are we going to how are we going to manage that what does society society look like you know as automation kicks in all of these things it just seems to me that it's like there's still this you know and we're humans we resist change like you know we, we're slow to act and things like this but it's like yeah to just keep doing the same thing and expecting it a different result is is crazy and i just don't really believe like I, I find it impossible to believe that the way that we've built this economic system is the only way like, yeah. it's just it just it's like evolution you know like evolution doesn't always come up with the best solution for a thing but it's just the circumstances on the ground led to natural selection going this way versus this way and you end up with this animal and not this one right like that's just the way it is so look at the situation has changed it's rapidly changed mm -hmm. even before pandemic pandemic is just highlighting it so what is another system what is a better system i think like a great start is better wealth redistribution i mean you can right. look at you know ecology and biology again for you know the accumulation of resources in a natural system it always tends to go to the top and then some fucking thing comes and shuffles it all around again. Fire, disease, earthquakes, you know, shit like this. So, I, yeah, I I wish I had more knowledge or answers to get, like, other than just, like, questions of frustration of, like, there's got to be a better way. Like, what, what, what are we doing here? I feel like I just keep saying that over and over. No, and I, I mean, I wish I had an answer. I We've talked about no growth systems and UBI and a lot of things. And I think that when AI does become a huge factor in everyone's lives, when there's um, self-driving cars and when trucking gets, you know, disrupted by uh, AI, I think that 
UBI really is a solution that's going to come into play. And I know that Steve Barg will probably be surprised hearing me say that. <laughs> but um, when it comes to pure economics and finance, I don't see any other path forward other than making things a little bit more fair mm -hmm. for hardworking people. Um, saying that though, it's going to take a lot of political will to, to fight special interests and, um, the richest among us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at Calgary and you look at the fact that the owners of the Calgary flames have millions and millions and millions of dollars at their disposal. We're just given $300 million from the city and province and didn't want to pay their workers when this all went down and it took, you know, public shaming to get them to do so. Yeah. So yeah, I think that, uh, I think it's going to be tough to get there yeah. to tell you the truth, but it's one of those things and it, where it's like, it felt like this tide was already shifting, right? Like the younger generations of people getting more politically active were, you know, whether it was climate change, uh, that kind of, I think, people started to kind of coalesce around that, but then wealth yeah. inequality became more attached to that, you know, and it mm -hmm. started, you know, so it's, you know, again, not to beat the dead horse, but don't let a crisis go to waste. I, I feel like this, you know, if you do like the, the political will might be there right after, yeah. right after something like this. Uh, but um, I don't know. It depends. I guess I like, I, you know, I don't want to be that person that's like rooting for things to go badly so that people realize, you know, the situation there. Yeah, in. exactly. But I think I it's mean, like, speaking unless to what's get, next. Yeah. What, like, how do you think the election is going to go down in the States? <laughs> I just, I, if, because I think that this, the pandemic is sort of going to go in ebbs and flows. There's going to be, it's going to be hard not to push people back to work in some aspect in the next, I don't know, one to three months. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like all the health advocates say that it's only a matter of weeks before it likely comes back. Mm -hmm. And so you're likely going to have another quarantine and tell me if I'm sort of speaking out of turn, but that's my impression of things. Yeah. And, totally and so I don't think that, until there's until there's a like a really good vaccine that can be distributed to everybody, it's like you will always have to manage the ebbs and flows of this, right? So it's like you will once you get through this initial surge. This is, you know, my slightly informed opinion. Um, once you get through this initial surge, you'll have more tools in the tool belt other than social distancing to help manage right. that surge and that's you know better testing more awareness um so with better testing and more awareness you should be able to when it does flare up clamp it down again uh more locally hopefully uh you will yeah. also should have better treatments in terms of like antivirals or something we'll have better idea anyway as to like what we can do to keep people more alive so we shouldn't get that surge in the in the health surge. but who knows but yeah so until it's Till you got a vaccine it's like you could yeah okay we start letting people out and doing things like this but it flares up again then you got to kind of clamp it down again and you're going to be balancing this and that's where we were talking about with like india and africa you know places like this it's like they haven't even seen the worst of it yet so it's like when the northern yeah. hemisphere is done with it done with it in quote air quotes here it's still going to be yeah. raging you know, through there. So it's, yeah, it's very likely that it comes back in a cycle. So anyway, back to what you were saying. So you got the. No, I mean, I want to talk about the American election for a right, bit, yeah, but yeah. I'm curious if, cause I've heard, you've heard things that say, Oh, when spring hits, it will likely die down in some sense, but we don't know that Do you. Yeah. So is that a complete guess? Is that it's, it's based something on something that they've seen before. Or? It's based on people are just basing that kind of the same with the herd immunity thing we talked about, right? Like we're just basing it on what we've seen in other things. So we know in right. other diseases that when you get it, you get some kind of immunity to it. Right. But we don't know the extent, right? We know that yeah. flu does poorly in the summer months. Like it doesn't spread as much and it kind of dies down. That's why we have seasonal flu. Right. 
but this isn't a flu. So yeah. who knows? Who knows if it's going <laughs> to, we, that's the thing is you just don't know. And it actually looks like by the fact that it's spreading in warm places right now, like Mexico and Australia, and you know, now it's getting to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank too heavily on the warm weather doing that much to, to slow it down, you know? Right. So yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. But it, it yeah, so be, back but, to the no. election, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really curious are they going to have a debate like Bernie and Joe had debates? Are they going to have all mail-in voting? How are going to, how, this is one of the most important things in the world in 2020, other than obviously the current state of affairs. Was this election? Is this election? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How are they going to accomplish that? <laughs> like what's going to happen? dude? You, how are they going to have the conventions? Do you think the, the you know? U.S. Postal Service can handle fucking mail-in voting and do i don't you think, think the they're... u.s postal service can handle anything yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know man like it's and especially like if because those are also going to be workers that would be you know at risk walking around right. from house to house you know putting those delivering those things um i don't know i mean mail-in voting makes the most sense but uh, it changes the whole dynamic of it. It also, like, I mean, the real, not conspiracy theory, but, you know, that leaning in that direction. It's like, what, what, what happens when they start floating the idea of, oh, well, we can't do the election? Yeah. Let's, we, Martial law. We have to, yeah, we have to postpone it. Because I remember, you remember back in, like, when when Trump was elected in the first years of his election and people were talking about, what what happens when he refuses to leave? What happens in this? And and it's like, and now you oh, yeah. have this. This is one of the first things I thought of was just like, well, this is exactly how people look at Hungary, you know? Victor yeah. oh, Orban yeah. in Hungary. Yeah. Like this is these are the scenarios when people are just like, you know what? We can't have an election. But yeah. I don't know. It it's funny how when you would read and I'm a bit of a sucker for punishment, so I read Breitbart and a bunch of those. <laughs> insane right-wing publications you want to get it out and you would read that you would read that when obama was in the administration and the smallest thing would happen and they would say oh he's gonna this is a plan he's gonna declare martial law he's gonna call off the election yeah. and he's gonna be a president for life we're gonna have a muslim kenyan dictator <laughs> yeah exactly barack hussein <laughs> obama it's crazy you don't get that from any of the left-wing no. sources no. right now no, no, no. and it's I think that's enough to prove that we have some friends, I won't name their names, but it's like a lot of us bring up crazy things that Trump does and they say, well, oh, all politicians are liars. Yeah. And they don't sort of take him out of the equation or saying that the right is a bit different Mm -hmm. than politics has been historically. And I think that's enough to prove that that is not the case. Yeah. If this was Obama, people would be up in arms and they couldn't believe they'd be saying, what's going to happen with, with the election? We need to figure something out right away. And yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But it's a, it's, it's a wild time, right? Yeah. It's a wild time. I do, it'll be, I am really curious to see how they're going to, how they're going to do this. Cause I mean, the clock's ticking down. Like they have to, if they haven't yeah. started thinking about it and I mean, it does play into Trump's favor to, to, to not deal with this till the last minute. Um, but I don't know. What do you think of Biden? <sighs> yeah. I mean, he's better than Trump, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I know I've said this before, but, uh, he has definitely lost his fastball. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's not, he's not the same guy he was 12 years ago. Or 20 years ago. He, when he was plagiarizing speeches. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, who doesn't want to say words that JFK said, yeah. right? <laughs> when someone's done it so well, he just didn't cite exactly. properly. What was he? <laughs> Don't reinvent the wheel. We have a wheel. Yeah. <laughs> There's a wheel there for a reason. No, I mean, um, he, he, you know, if we, you and I both listen to the Pod Save America show, and I think they make a good point often on that show where they talk about when he's the what's what's that nickname that he has the gentle warrior or something like this uh, 
what something like that. Um, but when yeah. he's empathetic and showing, you know, compassion and leadership at the same time, that's when he's at his strength. And I do see that. I've seen that in him. But he he when you get him off script and he's rambling about stuff, like it just starts to be like, oh shit, someone get grandpa back to the home because it's completely it, it doesn't completely. sound good. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, but uh, it. Uh, I wish that I, I, you know, we we've talked about this. I was a I was a fan of Bernie. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I think you make valid points in our WhatsApp group that he wouldn't be able to get the the things that he's promising done. But again, it's just the big picture sort of optimist kind of thing in me that I'm just like, why is this? Why is that? This should be the message, right? And I feel like in Canadian politics. It's like you look at, um, you know, what are the issues that people care about? You know, climate change was was it was arguably the defining issue of the last election in Canada, right? Uh, yeah. If you had a sensible, like it feels like there's just this vacuum in North American politics. Well, Western politics, we'll say, of just like, look, it, if you just had a sensible climate change plan that tries to address as much of the economic hardships as, as possible and reduce wealth inequality. And you delivered it in a way that you said, look, this is how we're going to do it. These are the numbers. This is what we can do. You know, like I look at the NDP in Canada and be like, if most people would agree with a lot of the shit you guys say ideologically, but oh, yeah. you have, there's no plan. There's no, there's no plan behind it. People are like, it's the same with the Greens and stuff like this. In Canada, they always poll well before the elections, and they've been going higher and higher and higher every election and local elections. They make all these breakthroughs right before people go to the ballot. And then they're like, uh, but actually, I think I'm just going to stick with what works. So it seems to me that there's this vacuum of like, if you could just, you know, nobody wants this polarized nonsense. The majority of people don't want this polarized nonsense. So if we could just have some kind of a sensible alternative but how do you break through how do you break through with that message i've i've personally feel like you have to have like a very well thought plan to explain to people how you're going to pay for it how you're going to do it and then you might be able to break through but it just seems like there's it's just screaming for it and maybe that's just me that's i i want this candidate and biden could be that but he just leans a little too you know status quo to me for me he is status quo, and there's no doubt about that. And I was an Elizabeth Warren fanboy. There's no doubt about I it. Thought she, was she, great. she veered pretty far left in some respects. She seemed to be um, in between Biden and Bernie, like the perfect, the perfect bridge there. You know? Yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, I like Bernie. I find him hugely compelling. I wish that we lived in a world where someone like him or Warren would get a chance to put their ideas in place, mm -hmm. but I don't think that we necessarily live in that world. And I think the thing that was good about Warren was she's tough. She's pragmatic. She will bully someone like she bullied Mike Bloomberg <laughs> if she has to. That was great. You know, and she's incredible at it. But going back to Canada, I mean, I think that you make a really good point. And to tell you the truth, I think one of the worst things that happened to Canada was Jack Layton passing oh, yeah. away because I think that he would have been prime minister without a doubt yep. if he would have, yep. you know, in that, sadly in, not. Yeah, exactly. In the election where it was Trudeau versus Harper, if it was Layton versus Harper, yeah, without a doubt. Completely. Yeah. Yeah, because he was just sort of, I mean, he was in office forever, but he was just sort of finding his footing. Yeah. And he had that recognition that is a necessity for politicians. He was sort of veering away from some NDP policies that didn't have a lot of support and, you know, places that you need electoral vi victories, like in the suburbs around Toronto and in Quebec. I mean, the block was getting really weak. Like, I, I, I really think that that was a tragedy for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. I absolutely agree. But uh, no, I mean, I'm not a Joe Biden guy, but I like his chances to win because he 
people love him. People know him and people love him. And hopefully he doesn't speak too often on camera because I think that's <laughs> going to be the worst case scenario. Or that the coronavirus doesn't get him, man. Like, that's the other thing. It's like these candidates are old. I mean, Trump, too. Can we can we not get the most powerful people in the world that are also 80, 80 years old and probably don't have the same capacity let alone the same energy that they did 20 years ago, let alone 40 years ago. Like, why aren't presidents 50 or 60 years old? It's crazy that they're 80 years old. Yeah, it makes no sense. I mean, my parents are tired all the time, <laughs> and they're not even 70, you know? <laughs> it's crazy. I look at why, you know, you look at your grandparents when they're that age, if, or if, if they are that age when they're still going, it's like, really? I cannot picture mm -hmm. that that's like you know that you're still yeah yeah but yeah it's weird but i mean it doesn't that speak to the you know the the system again as well i mean in the u.s for sure it's like you have to have you have to have spent so many years greasing the palms you know working the yeah. the donors and stuff like that to to be anointed to get your chance to be anointed because it really feels like that that's kind of what it is it's like an anointment. Oh, that's process. exactly you right. You put your yeah. you put your time in, and like it's like we knew that. I mean, as well as Buttigieg did in the primaries, he wasn't going to be the he wasn't going to be the nominee. No. You know, no. And even if I mean, he took all of the sort of base party line positions, hugely accomplished for a person of his age, Harvard background, McKinsey background, and he still didn't really have a shot. Yeah. Um, but in any, I mean, in any event, I think that one thing that is a positive from Trump getting elected is that he proved that you could be from outside of sort of the party system yeah. and get elected, yeah. you know, no one within the establishment when he was running wanted him to get elected. No. Everyone wanted Jeb, and then everyone wanted Rubio, and then everyone wanted Ted Cruz, which is insane because no one likes Ted no, Cruz. Not even his own family. Exactly. And how could you? The guy is the worst. <laughs> um, but uh, if if Trump has done one good thing, he has sort of said, if you can be compelling enough to enough people. Mm. Or gross enough. Or gross enough. Yeah. Same thing when it comes yeah. to that side of the equation. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, in any event, I mean, I hope that things change, but in the next little while, I uh, don't see it happening. And I think Biden will be smart enough to get really accomplished people behind him. And yeah, he's he's institutional. He believes in all the old tropes that the Democratic Party believes in. The big money is going to you know, force his hand on a lot of mm -hmm, things, mm -hmm. but he'll have a good cabinet around him. He'll have a strong vice president. Hopefully it's Elizabeth Warren, but yeah. Well, and I, yeah, it's, he's, he has made some uh, comments in a speech, I think where he was talking about where he's like, I can be the bridge to the new generation. I yeah. like that. I mean, this is something that if you listen to um, Dan Carlin, the hardcore history podcast guy, when he was doing he put out a new common sense this morning I, yeah, I think, or, or already crushed that yeah <laughs> but uh love that he's guy the best um when in episodes past of that common sense show he was talking about this idea of like if we just had you know people that ran on you know i'm gonna do this one thing and then i'm gonna leave you know like this yeah. is my issue this is my thing and then I'm gone. Not this like, and it goes to the politics for life, right? Like politician for life. You know, these people that, you know, I, that to me, I mean, obviously Biden is a politician for life. He's a career politician. That's what he's done. But to, to stand up there and say that like, yeah, I'm only doing this because I feel I have to because we face this Trump threat, which is right. terrible. That to me is a noble message. I like that message. And I could get, if I was a U.S. voter, I could get on board with that because it's like, yeah, all right, we got this guy. Even I, I, I think he could even do better if he said, look at, I won't even run for a second term. You can, you, you can find someone in, after. Like, let's just get through this and 
get things back on track and then let me go out to pasture. Exactly. That would be ideal. And I mean, I think that we've talked about this before, but my main thing is politicians shouldn't be mostly lawyers or career politicians. We need to have technocrats, mm-hmm. people who are experts in a certain field. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing that like this is completely anecdotal, but from what I've read is that Taiwan has done really, really well with the coronavirus because their vice president, I think, was an uh, epidemiologist in his past life. And obviously that's, you know, fortunate. Yeah, it couldn't be more fortunate. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that lawyers look at at every problem with a certain bend career politicians look at everything with a political sort of bend. We need people who have a wider perspective. Mm -hmm. We need scientists, we need engineers, we need people with a finance background. We need all sorts of people to fix their certain issues. And I think across the world, you're not seeing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a drama teacher, which is, you know, its own thing. (laughs) It's something. (laughs) I, I shouldn't have said that. I, I, Trudeau's, Whatever. I love Christia Freeland. You know that I'm, yeah. I have a crush on her. Yeah, yeah. No, she's I wish she was prime minister. Look at but, Trudeau uh, is fine. He's not, he's fine. He's not amazing. He's yeah. fine. You know, yeah. he bumbles through some shit, but he has good people around him and he the does. government is functioning fine. <laughs> That's all yeah. I got to say to yeah. say about it. Yeah. yeah. No, I couldn't agree yeah. more. Yeah. But I, I agree with you on that sense. And this is, again, like, you know, you, there was that youth movement in the uh, midterm elections in, in the U.S. You had people, AOC, what, like, or what do hater. you think of AOC? Yeah. I think it's cool that there's a, a person of a, you know, working class background with a different perspective that, that is in there. I mean, I yeah. think she's yeah. young and brash and full of energy, and that's also cool. I generally agree with the direction that that she views she's a little too woke for my taste at times that's a thing with people (laughs) they get a little too woke you know and that's something that i don't agree with but you know there's a lot that i agree with and i think that it like you said it would it would benefit everybody to have more variety more diversity in there and i mean that's one of the things that people talk about like diversity in school or and CEO boards and stuff like this. And it's like, obviously you can't mandate that. I don't think, I don't think you, it's, we have, I don't think we have a good system of mandating it, but why would it's tough to mandate something like right, that? Yeah. Exactly. But I, as much diversity as you can have, I think is a good thing. Yeah, I think, and I think it's borne out. There's some, there's some studies that show that, that like the more diverse a board is usually the more successful a company is or something like this. I don't know. It's very, you could p- probably poke holes a lot in a lot of the methodology of any sort of research that's making these kind of correlations. But um, it just seems to me like, why not have a range of ideas and viewpoints? If you want to tackle, like, this is right. what my background in science has taught me, is that, you know, if you're looking at a problem from just one way, you're probably not going to solve that problem. And if you look at science or whatever, most of the great discoveries come from somebody being way outside of your field doing something and you see that and you're like, Oh, that could be applied here. And then it, you know, it moves things forward. And again, this, I I think then comes to, you know, what this whole pandemic situation can teach us, you know, the shunning of expertise has for the last, like, you know, 10 years has been ridiculous, you know, the, and you see it in certain countries, the UK, the U S these, you know, right wing populist places that have been fuck these experts, fuck these eggs heads, eggheads telling us, you know, this. It's like, well, they're the ones that are now struggling the most with a when a scientific exactly. complex yeah. problem comes up. So it's like that is something, you know, um, you know, a, a more fair place to live, you know, these kind of things. But the expert thing was one exactly. for sure. That was just like yeah. I'm like, now everybody wants the wants the experts in the room, you know, when when shit hit the fan. Well, and, you know, I think that's a great point. But on top of that, for experts to matter, you need to have someone at the top who's both capable and curious 
and who's interested in hearing actual solutions rather than what they think will serve them best personally. So I mean, Wait, who are you talking about here? I think that <laughs> no one specifically, you know, I don't want to point fingers, but I mean, I think that in 10 years time, you're going to get not only too many books, but you're going to get some incredible case studies about how this is an absolute historic abject failure, sort of, I guess, in the same scale of like Chamberlain wanting to appease the Nazis, mm -hmm. uh, Herbert Hoover not wanting to do anything during the Great Depression, or W getting duped into going to, into Iraq. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I truly believe that this is this is something that is going to stick with people and going to be in history books in 10 and 50 and in 100 years. And this is going to be part of that one paragraph that you're going to see about the coronavirus. And perhaps that's just something that I think about because it serves my interests, but it's a, it's a wild time. <laughs> it, I, I know I've said that a few times. But. What what else can you say, man? What else can you yeah. say? But again, and then and I I agree. And then that that's to me that maybe that's why, you know, some of the optimistic things can come out of it on the other end because when you see how right. poorly the systems that we have in place, the leadership that some places have in place, you know, it really. Yeah, it, 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 it highlights a lot of the things. And I think that's one of the interesting things that I've been reading a lot of is, you know, yeah, highlighting the cracks, you know, seeing the cracks in the system. Before yeah, exactly. before we uh, wrap up a little here, um, what do you think? Maybe this is a little callous, but uh -oh. <laughs> what do you what do you think of going around the world and saying, uh, you know, which sort of strong men, which kind of places like this are either going to fall or get get strengthened by this? Like I'm thinking Russia. I'm thinking of the situation Turkey. Uh, yeah, I'll play that. <laughs> I love that. Brazil. I think that Brazil fun. is another one. Yeah. Um, so do you want to do those in that order? Sure. Why not? I think, uh, Putin gets stronger. Mm -hmm. As long as he doesn't get um, it. Um, and he, yeah. That's the caveat uh, with I mean, everyone. He, he does judo. So, yeah. you know, he'll, be, fine. Bears, he'll yeah. be riding shirtless on a bear and the mask jump on. over a waterfall. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I think Erdogan and Turkey is going to be fine. Um, because it seems like he is sort of taking control of the media and of uh, the army, which was his sort of main, I guess, nemesis or adversary. Um, in Brazil, I don't know enough about that guy. I've read a bit, mm -hmm. but it seems like his hold on power is a little more tenuous than the other two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, curious what your opinion is. I mean, yeah, I don't know this yeah I, this is out of my wheelhouse a little bit i know um it seems to me my opinion of it is that he seems the most likely and again this is kind of my you know <laughs> speculation whatever we're playing a game here he seems the yeah. most likely to me to use the crisis to try and put the dictatorship back in into into his country he's he's talked fondly of the dictatorship throughout his election uh, I don't yeah. think he's, you know, he's shown zero shame in terms of using that kind of language, using that kind of rhetoric. Um, he, up until like two days ago, seemed to be courting disaster by, yeah. you know, yeah. outright flaunting or flouting, whatever the word is, uh, the any sort of public health recommendation. He was chastising mayors and state governors that were putting in restrictions like he was so it's yeah. like he just seems like to have zero grip on either reality or he's playing for chaos that's kind of what it looks mm -hmm. like to me and brazil that it's a it's a i think it's it's a it's a huge country lots of wealth inequality um and lots of like diversity across the different regions and stuff so it's like it seems like if there's going to be one place where someone either needs to go in with a strong hand and just like 
rule things or it goes into chaos, right. that might be the place. You know, like I don't, I don't see a real orderly, uh, <laughs> you know, calm sort of measured response coming out of there to this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, and it seems like from what I read, Lula da Silva still has a lot of popularity. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the main proponents of putting him in jail. Yeah. But uh, you never know what's going to happen in countries like that. Yeah, it so, could shift. Like, I mean, look at yeah. no one saw that. No one thought that Chile was going to have all of these riots in the last month. You know, like that seemed like one of this, yeah. you know, okay, great. South America's becoming stable. Argentina, Chile, you know, that kind of, and then they popped off. So I don't know. Oh, totally. And and just like the health system and stuff in Brazil and South America in general, like that's a place to watch, I think, for like, oof, it could get bad. And when it gets bad and the poor are... Who knows what yeah, happens. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. could see lots of, lots of shifting. So I don't know that he's totally safe. I think he would have to have support of military. Like I think he, if he doesn't have the support of the military, then that's bad news for him because if it turns to chaos you know and the military decides not to to do anything you could well, de definitely see it switching i've heard the gangs in um some of the big cities in brazil have been the ones that have sort of been cordoning off favelas and saying no one in no one yeah. out no one works yeah 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 which is pretty wild to think about it's it's <laughs> If if your gangs have to be running the public health yeah. show, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The uh, it's not ideal. The one in Turkey I'm interested in because, you know, the elections that happened there in Istanbul, where he, where Erdogan got a big, uh, you know, slap on the wrist, basically. That wasn't too long ago. It was last year, but um, you know, there was cracks forming in his sort of hold it looked like anyway and if you go yeah. into a prolonged economic um trouble he's got this war now that is in syria which is basically he's walking a tightrope of not trying to fight the russians <laughs> yeah. yeah which yeah. is not good for anybody which is weird because yeah yeah i mean they've been allies sort of and had a tenuous relationship for a long well, they time they just and... bought all those russian weapons it pissed yeah. off it pissed yeah. off NATO and and everyone else and now they're potentially you know Russia's basically putting tripwire forces in the different parts of Syria to like buffer between Assad and 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 Erdogan it just like i mean maybe they just like shut all that shit down with the pandemic just kind of like hey look at let's all agree because it's in nobody's interest for Russia and Turkey to fight like neither of them want to fight each oh, other yeah. but it just yeah. makes me think that it's like is is he as safe as in power as maybe it, it seems uh maybe nobody wants yeah. to i mean the other interesting thing uh that comes out of all of these um and the the sort of one of the podcasts on of pod save america the pod save the world one they were they did a whole episode just recently on this of like how does you know the politics of all this and stuff but one of the issues that comes up is you can't protest you know, you can't go out and enforce and, and, and protest. So how does that, you know, maybe some of these guys are safe because of that. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think dictators or leaders of one party systems are going to be a lot more willing to take extreme measures, not only to combat the virus, but knowing that they sort of have this ability to couch certain policies and saying that this is because we're trying to tamp down the virus. Yeah. It's a window. And it's one of those things where it is. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 I mean, going into newspapers and shutting them down or, I mean, you can, it's that old trope after nine 11 for a couple of years, you would hear a bunch of dictators saying that everyone was a terrorist if they were against their faction, if yeah. they were against their regime. And it was sort of, it was normal course. It was part of the lexicon and people, if you use that as an excuse, you would have to be sort of an expert to realize that that's not exactly the case mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it's more complicated than that or whatever the issue was. 
So I think that you're going to see a lot of people trying to take advantage of the pandemic. Uh, Hungry. At the same time. We, we alluded to it before. Hungry. I mean, that, that's yeah. essentially what they've done. And I mean, he's been on that track for 10 years now, basically, of sort of yeah. whittling away at press freedoms and attacking the different systems and uh, the judiciary and all that. Um, this is Viktor Orban, the prime minister, now potentially for life of Hungary, because they put in, uh, they voted for emergency powers that have no, you know, the opposition wanted a sunset clause. That was their thing. It was like, look at like this will end. So let's let's yeah. put a you know restrictions on that. Because um, he did this with the migration crisis. They're still there, you know, and that was 2015. So they've been in a state of emergency where he gave himself a bunch of powers since then. And now they've just done it again. So he's allowed to rule by decree. So there's no no, no more voting on laws. What he says goes. Uh, and you can get imprisoned for, I think, up to eight years for spreading fake news. And who gets to, eight yeah, years, who gets yeah. to decide yeah. what fake news is? There you go. Well, if it doesn't help you, it's fake right, news. Exactly. I think is what we've learned. Well, and that's yeah. the thing is you gotta you gotta know that like somebody floated this past Trump and he's like, You could do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I love that, yeah. Victor. That is get him on guy. the phone. How, how do you do that? Tremendous. How do you do that? So I mean that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how the EU and uh, NATO deals with that. Because if this isn't a case for getting at least a suspension, what is, you know? Exactly. And how is, you yeah. know, the, the Hungary gets a shit ton of money from the EU. They get a lot of money from the EU. And if that tap runs out, I mean, he's been, again, I'm getting a lot of information from the Pod Save the World guys, but um, he, I mean, they have been, Russia has been building infrastructure. China has been building infrastructure in Hungary. So it kind of looked like maybe he was like, hey, if I piss off the EU, I can just kind of shift to these guys. But uh yeah. yeah, I mean, the EU has to do something. NATO has to do something. There's no way that like I, we can go all go to war for Hungary if, he, if this guy's you know a dictator in power. It. So I mean, mind I know, you, Turkey's a NATO ally too. Well, and that's the thing is that NATO is incredibly important, but when you start to look at some of those Eastern European countries, and that is sort of our buffer against one of the West traditional enemies, mm -hmm. obviously, but at one point they have to meet a certain threshold to get into the EU and into NATO. At what point can you slide backwards and you no longer meet that threshold? I don't think that that's really something that's being contemplated enough. Yeah. Well, I, I think, right? I think we now have a clear example of what that threshold is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's got to be something. So. And I know the, what uh, was what it? What do they call it? I don't know what they, is it the president of the EU parliament? No, the prime minister of the EU parliament? I don't know. Ursula von der Leyen, her name. Right. Um, yeah. she, she made a statement being like, look, at, we're reviewing this. You know, like this is, yeah. <laughs> this hasn't gone unnoticed, basically, yeah. uh, in diplomatic terms. Now what they do and, you know, obviously attention is, is shifted elsewhere, but I mean, it's, it would seem the, this, this will not stand. Yeah, this, this, <laughs> it's gotta be a line in the sand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If they do nothing, then, you know, it's Poland's next, uh, pick any other one of these tenuous, you know, place. I mean, Turkey's not getting into the EU anytime soon because he pissed them off with the migrant stuff, but um yeah yeah i don't know that's a weird one uh did you see that the uh the the dictator all supreme leader of little small little country out there with all the rest of the stands Tur turkmenistan banned the use of the word coronavirus i did not see that that's you're not even allowed though. to say it don't even say it you could go to jail for saying well if you don't say it it's not <laughs> yeah. a thing that's a thing. <laughs> exactly <laughs> he was it him who used to boil political distant dissidents alive oh, i don't know or is that one of the other i i shouldn't say that without <laughs> knowing but um, i don't know i don't know about that one i know he's been like this just it popped up in uh in german news uh you know it's a bit more in our sphere over here but uh yeah it popped up yeah. and it's just like his he's one of these crazy you know presidents for life and the the 
the supreme control that he has. I think that the article uh, from DW here in Germany was saying that in one of the press freedoms, journalism, journalistic press freedoms, you know, organizations for the world ranked them as having lower press freedoms than North Korea. Which is Ooh. a that's a milestone, baby. You've got to have a party for something like that. <laughs> and so now <laughs> you can't even say Corona. Not you can't even say it. it uh, no, I was thinking of Uzbekistan. So oh. let the record yeah, show. Let the record show. Yeah. yeah, we have a we have a good friend here who's from uh, Tajikistan, and uh, they uh, she has some interesting stories about. Tajikistan and life in the stands. Yeah, I would imagine it's. Yeah, <laughs> it's Anyhow. a different part of the world. Um, but yeah, that was the only that was the uh, the topics that I had uh, was to go around and pick the dictator that's going to that's going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? I mean. I mean, China, I can't we haven't talked else. about China at all. So that's maybe like, let's, let's do a little China. Um, cause you were just sharing an article, uh, today where what I, and I didn't, I didn't get a chance to read it, but who was saying, where was the source that was saying they fudged their numbers for sure. Their coronavirus numbers, was it intelligence sources or. Yeah, it was, um, it was an unnamed source within the intelligence community mm. who had come out. And so it's one of those things where I think it's probably right, but they're basically saying that they didn't share the extent nor how much harm the virus did to Wuhan or uh, other places in China. But something else that I was reading today that was interesting um, was that the Chinese have been pretty forthright when it comes to releasing the, uh, I think it's the genetic details of the virus. Yeah, no, they have, yeah. Um, and they release that to the public, and then that's actually been quite beneficial when it comes to trying to find a vaccine, trying to find mm -hmm. uh, potentially some antivirals at work and, and things of that nature. and making different testing. Yeah. They put a lot of that uh, data on uh, preprint servers. So that's, it's becoming a more of a trend in the academic circles to put your, before it goes through peer review, you can put it up in these, on these preprint servers. Uh, so basically the you put your research up there as it would appear in the peer review journal with the caveat that this has not gone through peer review. Basically it's, it's, okay. a, it's kind of a nice, you know, self-policing system that the whole community gets to see it. In this case, everybody got to see this data right away and yeah, use it. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. It actually also caught um, this system, caught that uh, paper from India at the beginning of this outbreak that was trying to say that it looked like coronavirus had elements of HIV in it, which conspiracy theories people took to be like oh my god it's an engineered virus look at it, it's an engineered virus oh, okay. there's elements of hiv in it they spliced it but the, they put it up on this preprint server and the virology community was just like this is garbage research get this out of here and so they were shamed into taking it down and it, it hasn't gone to actual publication so it's a good system it's well in some cases it's a good system you can debated either way but so they have been good in that but i wonder if that's scientists i don't like how free are the scientists in china to publish that up you know where they where they want i don't know did they do it uh without the the government knowing or was it you know a situation where nobody's you know they just yeah so i don't know so so they've been good on that. We've gotten that data from China, but whether that was like a sort of a state approved, state sponsored, yes, let's put out the data. I yeah, don't know. who knows? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't look like they're, you know, Xi Jinping, he's not in any in, in any way gonna be phased by this, I don't think. Yeah, it seems like um he has a better handle on power than sort of the last three or four leaders have in China and he's been sort of doing what he can to tamp down opposition and shore up his power and increase the amount of time that he can hold the office for, which 
Well, he's he can do it for life now, can he? Yeah. 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 So he's not going anywhere. But it'll it'll also be interesting to see how they play this now that they've sort of got it under control in their country. Well, at least according to the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, they're now stepping into the void uh, that the Americans normally would, you know, of being the international go-to for help. I mean, it probably helps them that a lot of supply chains start there anyway. So they have right. mass production facilities. Um but also, I mean, in terms of like, you know, like we didn't, that's the other thing that, you know, talk about the failure of leadership in the U.S. and how it's going to cost lives for them. Like we haven't even had a coordinated, you know, response from G7, from the Western countries, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's largely because this U.S. was, you know, isn't on board. So, you know, to have like China now be the one that everyone looks to, to sort of, and it's not like they're out there like coordinating the response between the other countries, but they're just going to, you know, give boatloads of aid to, to different places and they'll be the ones that everyone turns to, you know, so. Completely. I mean, there's a vacuum of leadership and because of that, it seems like they've been stepping to the forefront because no one else will, no one else mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, again sort of harkening back to my previous point it's it proves that those people who said it doesn't matter who leads the country it's all the same whoever gets elected politicians are all the same it's just not the case mm -hmm. you need uh, people in power who know what they're doing who are there for the right reasons and who are willing to trust the experts and, and figure out how to solve problems rather than figure out how to get the best story possible in the media. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, it is a wild time. It's, it's an absolute shame that this is happening now because things could have been quite a bit better in my opinion. Yeah, they could have. And, uh, as uh, let's we can you know begin to wind this thing down we've been going for a while now but um wild time things could have been better yeah for sure all of that i mean that's always true yeah is part of you okay i'm gonna admit that part of me is you know somewhat you know ex not excited is the wrong word you know but like the biology of the thing is obviously very interesting to me. This is sort of in my wheelhouse. This is what I studied, you know, not viruses specifically, but diseases and, and how they yeah. spread and things like that. Um, so that fascinates me. This, you know, being in a historical moment is, you know, I never, you know, 9-11, I guess, was the only other one that you can really say was like the sort of the, the shit that you know, change things and, and will go down in, in history books. But that didn't happen to us in Canada. We were affected by it, but it wasn't right. like acutely us. This is the whole world. This is something that's like this moment. And it's like every once in a while I catch myself because, you know, we've been, I got the days marked on my calendar here. It's been like basically, you know, almost three weeks that I've really been living going out to the shop and that's it going out to yeah. the grocery store, which is a five minute walk from my house and then coming home. That's it. And it's become sort of normal at times. You're just like, hey, this is just, this is just life now, you know? And then you get hit with those moments where you're just like, what the yeah. fuck is going yeah. on? Yeah. And then you kind of have to go back to like, okay, well life goes on. I got to do my things. I got to just, you know, but this is, so, you know, maybe, fascination you know excitement it's not it's maybe those are the wrong words fascination for sure is the right word excitement is maybe the wrong word but dude no i mean i i completely hear where you're coming from and for years leading up to this i wanted to be a part of sort of history defining moments you know mm -hmm. and uh I always wanted things to sort of not be normal course, to not follow the same sort of Monday work Monday to Friday. This is what I do. These are the things I do on the weekend. And so I always thought that I wanted something like this. And now that it's happening, 
um, uh, not so much. <laughs> you yeah. know? Uh, also, but I can our... completely understand where you're coming from because it's sort of in your realm and you yeah. have a better understanding of it. But uh, no, yeah, leading up to it, I always thought that this was something that, and I'm, I couldn't be more curious about it. I have, it's like insatiable. I stay up at night. I can't sleep. I need to know as much as I can, but I'm, yeah, it's, uh, I haven't been in a great place because of it. I'll say. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, you know, you want, you, you, oh yeah. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, we want the change, like uh, the potential for change, I think is a really cool part. You know, that's part of the excitement. That's part of the fascination for me is like, what the fuck is the world going to look like after this? And like all that we've just been talking about, the potential for change, the potential for radical change, the potential for positive change or negative is there. And that's exciting. When you're saying like, yeah, you're, you're leading up to this. If there's, you know, you want to be in those moments, you know, you kind of have those like, oh, wouldn't that be this? It just turns out that our historical moment is sit the fuck at home on the couch and watch Netflix, you know? Oh, completely, this yeah. Big, this is our big burden. And it's not a call to war. It's not a call to rebuild after an earthquake. It's not a, you know, it's like, a hey, just stay the fuck home. Oh, I mean, and there's so many good memes out there about how veterans from World War II or whatever yeah. are saying, my call to arms was landing on the beaches of Normandy and risking yeah. my lives alongside my fellow countrymen. Yeah. Yours is to sit at home and watch Netflix. Yeah. Eat all the food you want and do whatever you want. Just don't spit on people. Don't come in contact with people. Yeah. Don't yeah, yeah. see people. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I've, I've had a bit of a hard time with that, but no, I mean, it's it's like this is the disaster you get the disaster that you're designed for. You know? like, this was the disaster <laughs> yeah. that our our generations, yeah, exactly. our society at the moment could handle. It's like whoa, this is the know? disaster you deserved. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's not that uh, it's like oh, you think you liked all these things, all this Netflix, all this like sitting at home, not doing anything. Well, see how you like it when you got to do it for like three months straight. Yeah, exactly. They were the greatest generation. We are the laziest generation. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? We're going to do it and we're going to do it fucking well. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. I've been looking at my step counter and it's been woefully low. <laughs> Even after while taking my dogs on walks, it's, it's been a bit embarrassing. So I'm going to work uh, on that. Yeah, well, we'll see what we can do. Um, hey, man, it's been great talking to you. Uh, let's do it again. It's I hope uh, so. always a blast. It's been a pleasure. So get into some other, maybe some other things not Corona related. Or I think this is probably going to dominate things for a while. But you're one of the guys that I always go to for politics, for economics, for all that shit. So this has been great. And yeah, let's do it again. Hey, man, always a pleasure. We all miss you over here. Once again, thank you to Josh for, for joining me. And please do follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, at 2 brad for you Hit us up wherever you get your, your podcasts with a comment, a like, a follow, subscribe. That really helps us out. Um, and use Twitter, Instagram to get in touch with us, at 2 brad for you Give us comments. Give us, you know, criticism, shit talk, whatever you want to do. Uh, we're open to it. And, um, yeah, if there's a topic that you want covered, if there's a certain aspect of the virus that you want uh, to know about, you know, hit us up. We can do the best we can to try and help you get the information you want. Uh, so, yeah, Twitter, Instagram, too Brad for you. Thank you so much to Josh for joining us, and we will see you all next time. Stay safe, everybody.